How's it going, my friends? Today we are looking at a very simple songwriting technique, and that is using the pre-chorus in the bridge. It's a songwriting technique that is hot. It's trending right now. So we're going to look at not one, not two, but three songs that are using this technique right now. Lucky for you. First song is Ellie Goulding's Love Me Like You Do. So let's check that one out. So you got the point of that one, right? She basically just used the pre-chorus before the second chorus and used it in the bridge to drop into that third chorus. You might be thinking that songwriters are just being lazy. They're just taking the pre-chorus and sticking it in the bridge and then moving on. I would actually argue what's going on is the opposite, that people are spending a lot more time writing catchy, stronger pre-choruses and they are therefore extending the functionality of a pre-chorus. Typically, the function of a pre-chorus is just to transition into a bigger chorus, just to build more and more and more tension and then drop into a big chorus. But now what songwriters are doing are giving pre-choruses their own identity, their own catchiness, uh, while still serving that transitional purpose. And so it's, it's taking a lot more work to write these kinds of pre-choruses that are able to work in the way that the pre-choruses work in these three examples that we're looking at. So you gotta spend more time on your pre-courses, showing, showing them a little bit more love, making them feel confident about themselves, okay? Everyone wants to feel more confident. So do your pre-courses. An interesting pattern that I wanna point out is that with these examples, you're gonna have much quieter production under the bridge pre-chorus than you did in the previous pre-courses. <laughs> no, that's, that's quite a mouthful. Imagine this, you're in a library, you're studying or something like that, and then firecrackers start going off. Okay, it's gonna scare the crap out of you. Imagine now you're walking around on campus or something like that and firecrackers start going off. It might scare you. It's not gonna scare you like the firecrackers in the library did. And that's because the volume differential outside isn't as great as the volume differential between the, the volume in the library, which is like dead quiet, and then bah, 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 bah. And so the same idea is going on here. The volume differential between the, the pre-chorus and the second chorus, all right, isn't as big as a volume differential between the quiet bridge pre-chorus and the super loud third chorus. That's what they're going on here. They want that third chorus to hit way harder than the two previous choruses because the last chorus is really the main dish of the song. And the way to make it really hit is to make it super loud, but make it super loud after something super quiet. They want to create as big of a volume differential as possible there. And so we're gonna look at a more extreme case of this in uh, the next example, which is Miley Cyrus's Hands of Love. So as you can see, Miley Cyrus obviously uses her pre-chorus in the bridge. But as we also see, she took this whole volume differential thing further, pretty much using no production underneath the bridge pre-chorus. She 
She also does something else that's very cool, which is using a telephone effect on the vocals. Now, technically, what that does is it reduces the frequency spectrum that the vocals are expressed in. Okay, so it, it, she takes away the high frequencies and she takes away the low frequencies. So we're talking about volume differentials, right? So going from quiet to super freaking loud in the chorus. But there's also another type of differential that's going on, and that's the frequency spectrum differential. So you have a limited frequency spectrum to full-on frequency spectrum into the chorus. And so there's two big changes going on in the Miley Cyrus song, which makes it much more dramatic going into the third chorus, the final chorus, the main dish. You also have a production density differential because it's very minimal production in the bridge pre-chorus. There's really no production, just the vocal, and then full on full production, but that's really contributing to the volume differential as well. So there, there's really three, but uh, the last example that we're looking at is The Weekends Can't Feel My Face. This is the most complex example uh, because they're doing a lot of cool production things. They're having more minimal production, but it's in a much more subtle way, and I'll point that at after we look at the example go. She told me So there's a lot of fantastic freaking things going on in that uh, bridge pre-chorus. Um, if we compare it to the first pre-chorus, we can see the cool things that are going on. Um, first, the, f the first pre-chorus is building tension by, by having like a general ascending melody contour, and then with a ooh, 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 ooh. Be You're just waiting for that drop, right? So pardon my singing. In the bridge pre-chorus, what do they do? Well, they first drop the vocal down an octave. She told me don't worry about it. She told me don't worry about it. And they have this cool ambiance going on in the background. It's just super back. And so uh, what I mean by super back is that there's production depth it makes it seem like the song is further away to the listener. And that's another th variable that you can mess around with with making that chorus come in sounding huge is the pre-chorus sounds far away from the listener and then they're gonna slowly bring the production closer and closer and closer to the listener until you hit the chorus and the chorus just smacks you in the face. That's exactly what happens here. And so they start with a lot of reverb, delays, filtering. Filtering is where you're, uh, like in the Miley Cyrus song with the telephone effect, you cut frequencies down. And so you're not experiencing the full spectrum. So you have a lot of things going on. So that's three things. Octave below, so you don't have pitch energy. You have production depth, and so it's not right in your face. And you also are not experiencing the full frequency spectrum. And then they sing the pre-chorus again in the bridge pre-chorus, but then Abel is singing it an octave higher, like he does in the first pre-chorus that we listen to. And so that introduces pitch energy. She told me don't worry no more. We both know we can't go without it. And so what they also do is they slightly extend the very last part of the pre-chorus before the chorus drops. Ooh, 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 pfft. See what I mean? And so they do this all on purpose. They do it because they know that it's going to increase the drama when that last chorus freaking slams down. All right, my friends, this turned out to be a much more in-depth 
tutorial than I initially thought it was. We looked at actually using your pre-chorus in a bridge. And the implications of that is that you need to write stronger pre-choruses, pre-choruses that have their own identity, pre-choruses that are catchy in their own right, but also still serve a transitional function. All the, we also looked at all the subtle things you can do in the, in the production to help the transition into the chorus drop. And what did we look at? We looked at production density. We looked at um, messing with uh, spectrum differentials. We also looked at volume differentials and dynamics like that. I hope you guys got a lot out of that. I'm excited to see what you guys have to say in the comments. If you haven't subscribed, just subscribe. I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.